Okay, we are live and I'm chatting to Yandra again, as always, talking about business and social media. And I see many of you are watching already. Please go over to the comments, say hello, guys, start asking your questions so that we can get your questions. Hello, Yandra, how are you today? Hello, Magrit, always good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, can't complain. There's nothing to complain about. Just very grateful. I'm happy to be here as always and looking forward to our chat. Oh, that's great. So for those of you who are watching, we are talking about all things business, social media. Please go over to the comment, ask your questions so that we can answer it. And also let us know where you are watching from. So Mandy is saying hi there. Hi, Mandy. Lovely to have you here. So Yanre, what is up in the world of business and Social media and advertising, what is happening? Yeah, man, I think um, I haven't really paid attention over the last week to what's new. There's always new things coming out and tweaks being made by all the different platforms and whatnot. Um, my space is more the paid advertising space, as you know. But um, there's definitely been a, from what I can see, like a bit of an uptick um, in the way how people spend money. I think the... I was really impressed with January's numbers when it comes to our clients. And I've been, you know, February, I can see that it just feels like people have got a bit more money to spend than they did last year this time. I don't know if that's necessarily a true reflection. Uh, maybe it's just my perspective with the data that we have. I mean, we do have over 80 clients. Um, so I think I'm in a good mental space around the economy. Like I'm very optimistic about things. I know there's a lot of people who would disagree about how doom and gloom it might be, but I am an eternal optimist. But putting my realistic hat on, I can look at the data and actually say that things look mm -hmm. like, you know, it's improving, which is great. So I'm really excited for the rest of the year. And February, you know, was the month of love. And uh, we definitely felt that love uh, in terms of growth which is amazing and great. We're very grateful for, and I hope everybody on the other side can, can say the same. Well, that is incredible. And I have to say, I do share your sentiment on the, the market. Uh, but yeah, def definitely. But I also th uh, think that it is um, perhaps like you guys know how to advertise. I really believe in paid ad advertisements or social media ads. Um, I, I mean, our, our business is so reliant on it. Um, and I, I do believe that is really, if you understand how to do it, it is such, and I'm just so grateful. I was also thinking yesterday, I'm so grateful that I know how to run Facebook and Instagram ads. And it's something I learned uh, when I was still working for my boss and I was starting to play around. So I started doing, I think my first paid ad about 2016, 2017. And I'm yeah. so grateful because I don't know how else you're supposed to get out there and get in front of people if it wasn't for paid ads. So it's actually making... I don't know. It's, it's for me, it's just the most amazing thing. But you know what I was thinking about as well um, is how a company like, uh, because I see there's a new e-commerce brand advertising in South Africa from, from China, Tempu or Temu, whatever. Temu, and yeah, Temu, Temu. Temu. yeah. Yeah. So they're entering the market now strongly. Um, and obviously competition for Sheen. But I was actually also just reading up on how Sheen just appeared out of nowhere. Now, if you are a woman, you would probably know because we get shown so many ads. And I was actually going into sort of back engineering what it is that they are doing. And it's so interesting to see that, I mean, they run the targeted ads, um, uh, but then their website is so good to convert like first of all they've got amazing offers and I think um, it's one thing that a lot of people miss is having that offer that it's really so good and then the other thing Sheen does extremely well on their website is they have customer reviews on every piece of clothing but they don't only have reviews what they do is they get customers 
to take pictures of themselves in the clothing. Now, one of the big objections to buy Chinese uh, imported fashion, and I mean, I, I don't buy from Sheen. I'm not saying that I support them. I'm just saying that I, uh, because I know there's a lot of people that don't like the fast fashion, but what they do well and how they just came in and built this massive brand with ads. Uh, so with their reviews, they get people to take pictures of them, their customers, their clients. So it's real people. So you can go and look at the pictures. Now, the thing with um, fashion from Sheena is always the quality. So when you can actually see, so what the customers do is they take a picture when they get the thing, they take the material so you can actually sort of see and you see what it looks on. And then they will also say things like whether um, the sizes are correct. Like if it says a large, it's a large, or maybe it's a little bit of small size or a big size. And that is um, that is such a big secret, or not a secret, but something they do that converts. Because when I speak to like one of my friends, she buys from Sheen, I'm like, but how do you know the sizes fits? And she says, well, you just go and look at the reviews. Those reviews make people buy. It it converts, and yeah. that, that's just so interesting um, to see how they use it. And I really believe that one should look at companies that are big and what they do. Um, so often when I work with some of my students, I see they don't have reviews on the websites. And it's such a small thing, actually, but can make such a huge difference in your sales. Mm -hmm. No, that's true. Look, I mean, uh, yeah, Sheen, the growth has been amazing. Uh, I think it's the, the right type of products at the right price. And they're going quite aggressive mm -hmm. in the market. This is something I always say. I think passive marketing will get you passive results. And I think a lot of us are very scared to take a big risk in order to do marketing aggressively. But it's funny, like even if I look at VA Media for the first, you know, two or three years, at least from my point of view, we grew and we grew quite quickly, but we've never grown faster since 2021 when we went full out on actually aggressively marketing our services. And that's when I realized that there's a massive difference between marketing and marketing. Um, and what I mean by that is that I think a lot of us almost half ass it in a way. Um, and I don't I mean that with the, the utmost respect to everybody, but it's like we, we do a couple of organic posts here. We send a quick email once a month because someone said we had to. I read an article about it. So I have to send this mail quickly and hope for the best. But very seldom do we actually have a rigid proven strategy that actually allows you to spit out more money that you're investing when it comes to your advertising. And I think every single business owner, that should be their main focus. Nothing else is more important than finding a strategy that spits out leads or customers or money in exchange for the money that you're putting into it. So if you haven't figured that out, nothing is more important over the next 30, 60 or 90 days. Like you need to put your blinkers on, you need to get tunnel vision, and you should figure out how to create a strategy that allows you to put 1,000, 5,000, 10,000 Rand in, and then get on the back of that 10, 20, 30, 40,000 Rand back. That if, if you don't have that system, nothing is more important than figuring out how to get that right in the next 30 to 60 to 90 days. I mean, unless you're happy with being where you are, there's nothing wrong with being content. But we know that if you're not growing, you're actually dying as a business. So I think that creates an underlying level of anxiety and fear to always make me want to market as hard as possible <laughs> and as strategic as possible. Absolutely. So, wow, passive versus active marketing. And that is the difference whether you're going to see growth or not in your business. So, um, a, a week or two or three ago, we spoke about how to, or to focus on the problems in your business, the, the problems you experience in your business. And after we spoke about that, I actually went on this like mission to focus, to fix the problems that I'm experiencing because it's 
the most of the times it's the problems we avoid, we run away from it. And those are the problems that keep coming back. For instance, if problems is clients, then like you're saying, you have to go and figure out how to solve those problems. And I have to tell you, for me, since focusing on the problems I had in my business and it's problems you, you create yourself. It is it is things that you don't like doing, you avoid, you have problems, you don't want to f uh, figure it out. In my case, it was um, specific systems. And I just went, put my head down and started focusing on the problems that I'm experiencing. And it is amazing how that is changing um, our business. So I'm just thinking if a what problem... Yeah, I'm, I'm so I'm so relieved that I'm doing it because it's sort of like facing it. This is a problem. This is the thing I keep avoiding. This is the thing that I keep procrastinating on. So you know what? I'm literally the last two, three weeks just focusing on fixing the problems because we cannot grow if we still have all these little problems that we are running no. away from. So no. in order for me to really go into a growth um mindset and a growth state i have to fix the problems and i think this that you mentioned passive versus active marketing is a big big problem for yeah, i just want to correct you there. it's more passive versus just aggressive like i think aggressive. you know from my side is it's i mean you can probably use the word active but it's understanding that you, you passive marketing will get you passive results and i think sometimes we're just too passive about things we're like let me boost a post for 50 rand or let me hope for the best over here or let me quickly send an email as opposed to figuring out how the hell can I actually build a system that I can aggressively spend money on that will spit out more money on the back of it. Absolutely. And just taking that time because we're so in a rush to do whatever that is not working, exactly. just taking the time, if it takes you a month or two months, but building that system getting the information you need. So passive versus aggressive, aggressive marketing. Yeah. yeah. And I think a lot of people can obviously assume that aggressive means you need to spend as much as possible. And that's not really what I mean. I'm not saying that you should go and start spending money that you don't have. I just mean changing your mindset to not procrastinate on figuring out a way to grow the business through marketing channels. I think sometimes we find ourselves in this, you know, kind of like a rock and a hard place scenario where we have all these things to do to keep the business alive. We know what we should do to grow the business, but we don't have the time or the energy to do it after we've done all the necessary tasks of the day. So therefore we end up procrastinating. We go, I'll do it next week or I'll do it next month. Or, you know, this month has been good because we had a lot of referrals. So let's just hope that next month is just as good. Mm -hmm. And it's switching that passive voice off and go, no, no, I still need to figure this out. I can't just depend on referrals. If I really want to scale on my terms, I need a system or a strategy that actually can predictably help me grow my business. And I think it's switching that passive mindset to more of an aggressive and immediate urgency mindset to go, I need to figure this out now as quickly as possible. Nothing is more important. And a way that I often think about this is, there is someone out there right now needing what you have to offer. And it is your job to go out there and make sure that they are aware of you. And then when they are aware of you, when they showed interest, to follow up and follow up and follow up. So I see CHNA Health and Wellness is saying hi from Joba. Guys, if you've got questions, please post them and we will answer them right here on the, li on the live. Christine is saying, good morning all from Cape Town and Nicoline from Paul. Uh, we've got uh, Geraldine, good morning from, and then we've got Haneri Besser from Bloom. Hello, Haneri. And Pietri is saying, yes, face those giants in your life. Don't run away from them. Mm -hmm. Angie is good morning from PE. And then we've got another good morning. Guys, if you've got any questions relating your business, getting customers, using social media, please post the comments and we will answer it. Hello, Susan from Clarkstorp. And then Buetavo, I see the Edwards, someone from Buetavo. It's Nampu in Buetavo at the moment. I think it's Buetavo, yeah. And apparently... The Nampu show is huge. My dad was there, so he was telling me <laughs> yesterday. Yeah, apparently it is just so big, so many people. So, yeah, awesome. let's see what we have here. 
Good morning. It's Man Cave Nursery Ornaments and Pots. My problem is getting customers, and there are so many people promising their systems work best. How do you know whom to sign with? Regards, Steph from Pretoria. Yeah, I mean, you must do your own due diligence. Follow your gut. There's there's a logical way. There's a, a more intuitive way. I think, you know, if you've got a strong intuition, then you can sniff out the BS and you will be able to pick up just by listening to someone speak, whether they actually have the knowledge, the experience and the expertise to get you to where you need to be. Uh, I spoke to, you know, a multimillionaire uh, mentor of mine once and he said, Yandre, you know immediately in someone's voice how successful they are. And that was such a beautiful quote that I learned on the day because he said, and, he, and since then I paid attention to people's voice, their voices, how they actually speak. So there's a depth to it almost. You know, it's not a lot of people who are very new in the game. For example, it's not for everybody, but you can pick up there's a sense of, instability in their voice or they might be they might be stumbling over their words or they might be confusing certain metrics or they might just come across as very anxious or very fast paced or he says you can easily pick up in someone and this is not something that you can just study and then follow it like an algorithm necessarily but your intuition if you focus on it can guide you and there's a sense of depth to how people speak to how successful they truly are and whether the success is actually authentic and true because a lot of the time people fake it and they fake it till they actually make it so <laughs> hopefully your intuition can pick up on that depth and at the same time you know make you feel comfortable with who you're going with but also on the flip side of that i think it's just following the company, you know, looking at the company that you are speaking to and ask yourself, who is this person? Googling them, looking on social media to see what else they've achieved, maybe looking at reviews to see who else have used their services in the past and what they have to say about their services as well. So it's really just doing your own due diligence from a more logical reasoning standpoint. I mean, it's easy to say follow your intu intuition, but you know, it's not everybody that can do that. So from a more objective, logical reasoning viewpoint, I think just do your due diligence, like look deeper into the company. You know, how many people do they have? Where do they operate from? Do they do they have any feedback or testimonials that you can look at? Do they have customers that you can call and, and ask, hey, have you used this before? Let me know what you think. So it's just doing your own due diligence at the end of the day that might help you make the right choice as opposed to wasting money. But again, not everybody is perfect. So there's always a chance that it might not work for your business, regardless of how bulletproof the system is. That's just something that you have to understand. So Angela is saying, um, please advise on strategies for professional consultants. Oh, it's Ingela, Ingela White. So Ingela, for a professional consultant, what you need, it's always about understanding um, man cave for you as well. What is the strategy behind my business model? And this is just what I wanted to add for man cave is, um, when someone uh, say, say they're going to help you, do they have a proper strategy that actually makes sense? So, um, if you are a professional consultant, you have to ask yourself, what is my strategy of getting people in my business and converting them um, into leads and then into customers. There's basically three stages. Before someone becomes a customer, they were a lead. So what is a lead? A lead is someone that fits your perfect customer profile. And before they are a lead, they were just random traffic on the internet. It was just random people scrolling on the internet. So you basically have to, from a whole pool of people, um, get leads to fall through so people that fit the profile and then when they are leads, they're not customer yet, but they actually showed interest, they fit your profile, they actually do need your services. Then from there, you must have the system to convert them into customers. Now we have to think, okay, so it goes from traffic on the internet. How do I get in front of 
those people that need my service. And that is two things that you need to do. It's as simple as that. The one is you need to have a organic um, social media strategy, an organic social media strategy where you post organic content that will resonate with your ideal customers. So that is how people discover your brand on social media or your, your name. That would include things like doing educational videos, educating people about the service, giving them more valuable tips. And normally how to find um, topics for educational videos is just go and look at what do your people often ask you? So professional service, I, I don't know what you do, but say, for instance, you are an uh, English tutor or whatever. So go and, uh, and answer the questions people always ask. So three ways to study for your next exam. Or if you are a physiotherapist, um, do these three stretch exercises at home when you have back pain. Um, very simple, easy to use strategy. So that is your organic. But unfortunately, um, organic content is not a strategy that we can rely on for consistent leads. That just supports all our other efforts. So we need to have that because when people discover us, they want to go and see, uh, get more information, and then they land on your organic and unfortunately, um, organic content don't reach that many people. So together with your organic strategy, you need a paid strategy. So with a paid strategy, it's very simple. You either have something that people want, like a guide, and you run ads so that people can download this guide, or you can run ads for people to join some or other event or a talk that you have. You can do a talk on Zoom where you tell people, um, say, for instance, your professional services and helping people lose weight. You can do a, a talk where you say, um, in that talk, I'm going to help you lose weight for before summer, and then people sign up. So those people become leads. So everyone that signs up are leads, but they are not customers yet. And then from there, you need to take them. So now you inform them, they get to see your service. So I want you to look at this as like a little expo. When you do a live event or an online event, that is like going to like a baby expo where you show what is possible. You show the features of your product or service, your service in this case. Um, what, what, so people can resonate with that. And then from there, people become customers. And that is your strategy. So definitely only the two things, organic and a paid strategy. Anything you want to add, Yandre? I think you covered it all. I think um, you've done beautifully. I think the one thing I can say that it works very well for consultants specifically is uh, VSL. Um, now, VSL is something we call a video sales letter. So you build a bit of a funnel if you will. I don't know if you guys know the word funnel, what it actually means. But we have a few consultants that we're working with internationally. And we've had some pretty good success by building out an actual VSL funnel. So when you run the ads, on the back of that, we send them to a landing page, where we have a strong headline explaining the benefits of what they're about to receive. And with that, there's also a video. So a video just explaining what they're going to be finding once they leave their details. Then when they leave their details, they go to a second page. And that's usually where we do the actual VSL. So the video sales that are where we do a quick little bit of training or we explain the system we're selling or they're selling or the services that they're selling, what makes those services unique and so forth. And after they watch the video, they can then schedule a call in order to you know, have a sales call with a representative on the team to see if the product or the software or the services might actually be a fit for them. And that works amazingly well for, for some of the consultants and us well, from the international perspective. We've done it locally. That also works. Um, there's nothing wrong with, with where you're doing it, but we've got a couple of consultants internationally. So I'm referring to the international market because of the fact that we have more evidence and data on that side of it. So if you don't have like a website or funnel software, which is obviously preferred, but I know, especially in South Africa, a lot of people don't have it. Then another way you can run ads is you can use Facebook lead ads, which is also a great idea. Um, you just need to ask a few questions. So lead ad is where you don't need a website, 
and they complete a little form. But then you need to have um, also a follow up strategy. So once they show an interest, um, so I was actually, I, I actually was on uh, doing a video training on this, Yandre, on, on exactly how lead forms work. And so um, I went on Facebook and I saw, okay, here's a car company and they did a lead form. So I recorded my screen to show people, okay, this is what the lead ad looks like. You click on it, it's got a few questions and then you submit. And then about an hour later, the company called me. Hi, I hear you're interested in this new car. I'm like, no, 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 I actually just did it for, I just completed it. But that's the thing, like there's no point in having the lead ad. And oh, not we, have auto, we have auto dealerships on our in our books yeah. uh, that we run lead form ads for, and it works really well. We run lead form ads for people who want to buy cars and people who want to sell their cars as well. And then, um, because those can work for, um, optometrists as well for beauticians hmm. um, so I'd I think to ask you with that so do you then connect it to email or do you get salespeople to follow up and call we do both so so it's not it's not a binary thing it's not either or it's always both it's always do as much as possible to remind the person um, mm. but the problem we see with deed form ads is sometimes people are struggle to make the connection with the salesperson on the other side so in that Example, you stopped and thought, hey, this is a car ad and I'm going to inquire so that I can show my community on how it works. So when they phoned you, because you've put so much time and effort into understanding what you're doing, you were fully aware of who's calling you. Mm -hmm. But we've seen sometimes, unless it's a very specific service, like a decking company or interior design, or sometimes people forget what they signed up for. Uh, mm. we've, we've seen that happen. So people go, excuse me, where, where are you phoning, phoning from? Why are you phoning me? And they go, yo, you filled in your details on a lead form ad. And they go, no, I didn't. And it's like, uh, you did. Otherwise, I wouldn't have it in front of me. So I think what you need to do in order to avoid that from happening is to have email automations fire on the back of that mm. to say, hey, thank you for your inquiry. Uh, we have WhatsApp automation that also fires. It sends them a WhatsApp and says, hey, thanks for inquiring. This is who we are. If you want to reach us, contact us now or sales representative will be contacting you soon. And then someone picks up the phone and phones them as well. So we WhatsApp, SMS, email, phone call, basically mm -hmm. everything but sending a pigeon their way. Yeah. Yeah. So um, that that is... That is obviously very important, the follow up. So I was just thinking about the WhatsApp as well. That is quite a, a good way. Um, and what do you find is your success rate with WhatsApp ads if you just run an ad to WhatsApp? I actually see a question there about WhatsApp ads. I wonder if you want to bring that up because I okay. feel this is be very contextual. Okay. Um, Let's get it up. Where is it? Uh, I, saw, I saw it there. I actually can't. I'm not logged in, so I can't. It's uh, uh, Mark is full, full of love. Um, it was. Oh, okay. Comment, yeah. So she said, you know, advi we had, uh, advise converting WhatsApp inquiries into sales. We have Facebook ads running with a call to action to contact us. We do follow up with messages, but only have one out of 20 will, that actually converts. Other ways to get more sales conversions. So touching on this question and then also referring or referring back to what you were saying is WhatsApp is extremely powerful. But in this case, you know, Mark is for Lifter saying, look, we only have a 5% conversion rate. Now, the reality is if you had an online store, you'd only have a 1% or a 2% conversion rate. So, I mean, we have many, we have obviously many clients in the e-commerce space, number one. But number two, we have two or three of our own businesses in the e-com space too. And I mean, if I look at our own conversion rate today, we've done 15 orders and we're sitting at 1.74% conversion rate. So... For the month, uh, we're sitting at 1.97%. So it means that only 2% of the people convert that we actually that actually clicks on the ads. Now, there's nothing wrong with your conversion rate necessarily. WhatsApp will have a higher conversion rate purely because of the fact that there is a lot more of a personal touch. Uh, you know, you are messaging someone back and forth, so there's a bit of a stronger connection. So immediately that connection creates trust and credibility. So what you need to understand is that business is a numbers game. So as opposed to getting frustrated about the 15 people who, or the 19 people who didn't convert, what you should be doing is spending your time and energy on learning objection handling, 
trying to understand why people didn't actually proceed. So using that feedback and that insight to understand what you can do or say to improve your sales conversion rate, because sometimes it's not you have to do more things, it's you have to position the product or the service better so people can understand the value. So this becomes a psychological tweak more than an actual actual technical one, number one. That's the first thing that I would do is going, well, how are you replying to these messages? And are there ways to change that me the messaging or the wording specifically and phrase the, the questions or the answers so that the person on the other side better understands the value? Because if they did and the value checked out, you know, there's a good chance that you would get the deal. So improving that, number one. And then number two is then making peace with the fact that this is a numbers game. You have a 5% conversion rate. Maybe you can get that to six, maybe seven, maybe eight, maybe nine. But ultimately, it will always be a numbers game. So you should be spending your energy on generating more leads so that you can close more deals. So the question is, how can you now get 40 people in order to close two or three? And then 60 to close four to six. So in essence, it's really looking at it from that point of view, as opposed to going, what else can I do in order to convert more of these people? Because that's natural. There's a huge amount of people that are just browsing, just window shopping. They're just inquiring for the sake of inquiring. And you can't change that necessarily. So understand it's a numbers game. Do what you can in order to generate more numbers. So this is where the business economics become very crucial. So if you are spending money on WhatsApp, campaigns how much have you spent to get those 20 leads and then if one person converts how much have you spent on the 20 leads and that one conversion then technically so if you spent for example a thousand rand on 20 leads so let's say you've got a thousand rand let's make it 500 bucks and you've got 20 leads then you're paying 25 rand a lead now if you've got one sale because you've spent 500 rand then you your cost of a sale is technically 500 bucks so now you need to ask yourself can I afford to acquire a customer at 500 bucks? So if you're selling a product that's a thousand rand or a thousand five hundred rand or maybe two thousand rand, and hopefully it's good profit margin built into the product, then you're running a profitable advertising campaign. So now it's just spending more money. So you or business can make more money. That's literally the the science behind it, I suppose. And then um what I definitely I oh, just want to ask you as well, because you've got, um, it's sort of like an, an elite kind of uh, product. Um, I would do a lot of educational content, live videos like this. Like if you, um, and, and because you basically um, selling a product that's connected to a kind of movement of parents wanting to give, their kids um, food that doesn't have all the preservatives in that we get. So it's extremely important to create a community, um, an organic community of mommies where you educate them, where you, under where you understand, like you get these mommies in a group, in a supportive group. Like if you can imagine now you had a community, maybe it was a group on Facebook, maybe it was emails or whatever, where you could support um, mommies with newborn babies because that is the most hectic time for a mom. Now, if you come in as a supportive role, creating a community where people know when you have a newborn baby, you have to join that community because there's so much love and there's so much support. And then you start to educate mommies on how to, um, about food. And because that, that is the biggest thing. Like if you have a new baby, um, you know, you don't know, you're so confused. Everyone tells you different things. So if you are very, very aggressive with, and your know, aggressive doesn't fit in, but in creating that community in, in thinking like you have to help moms with babies because they are super confused. They don't know what is going on. And you have to sort of go in an educator role, becoming the person that mommies want to listen to. And at the back of it is your food. So that is exactly, if I can get back to 
turning because remember you also lead leads and customers so before they customers they leads and before they leads they're just traffic so from all the traffic on the internet you need to your community the purpose of the community is to suss out the right traffic so pregnant mamas uh, mamas with babies they become they are the traffic that become leads so how do you attract those leads uh maybe with uh guide or a free group or whatever and then you get all of those people now you have like a pool of 10,000 20,000 whatever people in a pool and from them they can become customers so you market you know you educate people on your product and if you do that that becomes very supportive of your paid ads and then also because I see you do have a shop um, I think one of the problems that you might be encountering is maybe you feel like you're not getting the right people on WhatsApp, but then rather get people on an email list um, uh, and maybe run ads straight to your shop and see if that works. But definitely one thing, and it, I know it's a long-term strategy, but if you can focus on becoming a tribe leader and your tribe is all, all the moms who's pregnant and about to get their baby and you know what those moms need and your mission in life is to get to every single parent because you need to go and educate them that they don't feed their kids all this other crap because we don't know that we don't know mm -hmm. that you know you would think we know that we don't so you you have to go on this mission tell yourself your mission is to reach every single pregnant woman somehow Put them in some or other community. It can be a Facebook group. It can be um, email. Obviously, I'm a big fan of, of email. And all you do there is educate, educate, educate. So they can fall in love with you. You are the one they want to go to. You are the one they want to ask advice for. And then obviously, they're going to want to buy your product. 100%. So what's next? There's a, there's a, oh, here we go. So Gina, what gives best bang for buck for boosting posts, Facebook, Google campaigns, or video boosting? So, yeah, I think this, it's a very nuanced answer. So if, let's start with whether it should, you, it should be Facebook or Instagram or Google. It kind of depends on the industry. So we've seen different industries perform better on Google where others perform better on social. And if I have to explain how that works, Think about it for yourself. If you in the food space or the luxuries item space or travel space or something that's extremely visual, then Instagram can work really well. And it could potentially work better than Google because most of those people are already advertising on Google, which means it's extremely competitive. So the cost of a click is really high which means that the cost of an inquiry is going to be high, which means the cost of a new client or customer is going to be high, which means there's less profitability for you at the end of the day, unless you really tweak your landing pages and campaigns accordingly. So this is where you can start to play around with social because it's such a visual thing. So Instagram is basically built on just a being a visual platform because there's nothing else you can do but see photos and videos. So on Facebook, you can still read a lot of text you can read a news article you can there's other forms of information that you can consume where on instagram it's purely photos and videos so that's where brands that are very visually appealing can do really well so we've seen kids birthday parties uh, plant wedding planners um, all of these brands do sometimes better on social than they actually do on google because of the fact that Google is very competitive and social is not something that they're really experimenting with, or at least their competitors are experimenting with. But because it's such a visual thing, people can see the actual wedding that took place and they can see the cake that was made and they can see the restaurant's food or, you know, the delicious meals and all these things. You're giving them a taste of the experience, no pun intended. So with that said, it's, it's a very nuanced answer. I, I need to understand your business maybe to give you more contextual advice. But I think if you can think about it that way, you will start to gain a deeper perspective on what to test and then see what works best for your business, number one. Number two, um, what works best between video and images. Again, that's something that you're going to have to test because I've run image ads myself that do really well. But lately, I see my reels. I take reels. 
um, that I do on Instagram, I start running them as ads. So I create Instagram story format video type um, content. And then I run that as an ad on Facebook and they do really well as long as it's straight to the point. So 30 to 60 seconds, nothing longer. Strong call to action um, with some subtitles to make it easier for people to consume. And the content or the video in itself shouldn't be too monotone. So you want to maybe like bring in some effects or zoom in and zoom out. And, you know, we want to hold people's attention with things happening on the screen. If you can do that, then you can have a really good result from a paid advertising standpoint on social with video, most likely better than images. But again, if you have got maybe an online store, there is always place for a carousel ad just showing the product and the price, the was price, the before price, or the was price and the now price. Stuff like that still works. So you're going to have to test. And I'm sorry it's not a black and white answer you were hoping for, but I'm not here to make this <laughs> black and white because that's going to be impossible. I'm here to give you the best advice, which means I need to educate you so you can broaden your perspective and then make, make the best decision for yourself. So I hope that helps. So um, I think also a lot of the times, and I'm not saying this is this is your in your case, but sometimes we want to just run to Facebook to actually be our business. And sometimes it's not a social media problem that you have, but it's actually a, actually a business problem. So it's yeah. very important to understand before you can sell on social media, you need to have a sellable product. And there is a nice word like the product market price fit. I think that's what you guys also call it, something like that. You must make sure that you have a product that the market wants at that specific price. And how do you know that? By selling to people you already know offline. So it's super, super important. A lot of the times we don't know what to do on social media because we've never sold one product and now we want to go to social media to sell the product. So it's important to have a, a kind of business that's, you know, like a product that mm. people actually want so that you, you can go to social media and talk about your product. And social media is very much just like real life. If you meet someone, if you have a shop and someone walks in, you would, and they ask a question, you would tell them, you would recommend things to them, you would give them advice, you would maybe educate them on new products. It's exactly the same. So a lot of the times, also people who are successful in offline businesses just don't know how to translate that to online. But I think I just wanted to mention it's important that you must have something that people actually want. You can test your product online as well. But um, it's that concept that it's much easier to sell something to someone that already knows you. So if I have a new product or a new idea, the best way to test it is to go to my friends that already know me. They know I'm a trusted person. So we've already crossed that hurdle. I don't have to tell them they can trust me. I must just figure out whether they like the product at this price. Whereas if you start selling to strangers mm -hmm. online, they don't even know you. They don't know if they can trust you. So you must first prove to them that you can be trusted. That's why it's always easier to taste new products or services uh, to people that already know you, maybe your current customers. Um, and see if if they want it. So I think Isabel's question was very much the same. My question is regarding marketing on Facebook, Instagram, and Google. I've almost zero followers on Instagram or Facebook. What would be the best way to gain traction? You so want to go? You want... I mean, use more the organic side, but okay. I think I can so, give some pointers. But I think yeah, maybe yeah. you start. So no. obviously you, you can obviously run ads to grow your page, but that is not one of my uh, favorite strategies. I don't like that because um, I feel it's important to learn, to find, to find your voice online, to learn how to talk about your product or showcase your product in a way that um, people can actually understand it. So obviously organically, um, you should start to understand who is your ideal customer, what are their pain points, and then start to create videos. That is the best way. Just start talking about your product, show it, educate people. And Yandra, actually what we are doing right now is exactly that. So we, this is an organic social media live. What are we doing? We're just mm. talking about um, 
what we do, our, our services. And then when people feel like, okay, that makes sense, they hear us, then they can decide, okay, do I want to, I mean, I'm a social media educator, I sell courses where I teach you how to do it, you have the agency, um, so people get to know us, and then they can decide, you know, and that is exactly the same strategy. So I think um, it's always interesting also to go and back engineer other people's strategies. So what I do is about, I don't know what your product is, but I would go to a successful business online in that space and literally go and back engineer that. So yesterday I had a session for a dietitian who just moved and she wanted to see what she must do. She also does online consultations and also sell programs. And I asked her, okay, so let's go and look at who do you follow internationally that, that you really like. And we went to that person's page and we back engineered the strategy. I showed her, can you see, this is the a social media organic is the beginning of the funnel from here. She gives us a free guide. She takes us to um, something. There's a video that educates us. And from there, we can book a call. We can buy something. So it's also whether maybe you've got e-commerce, then go to an e-commerce store and see exactly what they do. Okay. So Alice, Alice, Alice is one of my students. So we need to talk. <laughs> we had a very nice session yesterday, Alice, around... Um, online courses. So um, I don't know if you uh, attended yesterday's session. It was an hour. It was for a dietitian. So we'll, if you haven't attended it, go and watch it. But otherwise, talk to us in the group and then we will help you. That is what we are there for. And overthinking is one of those things we all do. So don't worry about that. Yeah, and that's the, so this is uh, this year, just to touch on what Alice was saying about overthinking for the English speak speaking people out there who didn't understand her comment. She says that she overthinks things and that she it basically is hindering her from moving forward because of the fact that she overthinks everything. And this is the year for me where I just flow. I said to the people around me, to my wife, to my colleagues, that this year I don't have fear or, any, or anxiety. So I am not going to try and control this year. This is the first year where I'm going to let go and completely get out of my own way because we are our own worst enemy. And it's because how our minds have been programmed by the trauma that we've had on our lives, maybe people that we've had, family, friends, whatever, maybe all of that mm -hmm. has accumulated to the mindset that you have today. So your mindset is basically a summary of all those things. So the better you understand your mind and why your mind is acting the way that it's acting, the stronger you are becoming because the more you are starting to take power back because mm -hmm. you are not your mind. And I don't want to make this a philosophical conversation, but often we think you are your mind, but you're not. Your mind is just a result of all the stuff that's happened to you. That is not you. So when you start to understand that, you're starting to understand your thoughts. And when you start to understand where your thoughts are originating from and why it's originating from those places, you become very powerful. You're taking your power back as a human being. And what I've started doing is, how do I know my mind really knows what it needs to know? And how does it? I know it's making the best decisions? And it's just not. So... This year is my year to just live and flow and call it faith, whatever you want to call it. And it's been an amazing year so far. Like there are things that happen occasionally during the day that makes you go, oof, should that be happening? It creates a bit of stress and anxiety for maybe an hour or two. But then I re remind myself, this is not the year that to stress about it. And my goal this year is to literally try and live the whole year that way. And I said to myself that if I come and I reach the end of 2024 and everything is fallen apart, then I'll just rebuild it. It's fine. You know, I'm still young. I can rebuild everything. So I want to give myself 12 months with this mindset and then see where I end up. And if it works, then I'm going to continue doing it. And if it doesn't work, then I'm going to stop. But I'm going to give it 12 months and then see where I am. So, Alice, I deeply resonate with you. I think I'm also quite the overthinker. I think most people are, but I think over time, over the last three or four years, I've come to understand how my mind works. I've come to understand where my thoughts originate from. I've come to understand what my thoughts truly are. And then you realize it's all just an illusion. Your thoughts are just delusional, actually. You're delusional because of the thoughts that you have. 
And in essence, when you stop to overthink things and you just take action mm. and, and have faith that things will work out the way that it should constantly, no matter what happens, no matter how life shows up, no matter, you know, we, we've had people leave our company that got better offers and really good people sometimes. And it's sad. Like, and I get anxious. Are we going to be able to replace them? Are we going to be able to find someone just as hardworking and, you know, amazing. And then before I know it, three weeks later, we find someone else and they amazing and they fit in and, and I've realized that you can stress about these things or you can just take action and try your best to, you know, to, to fill that spot or fix that problem that you have. But outside of that, what's the point of stressing? What's the point of worrying? So you just let go and, you know, have faith that everything will work out the way that it should. And if it doesn't, then there's always lessons to be learned within, you know. So that's my perspective on the matter. Yeah, I, I agree so much with you on this. Um, so... We are all overthinkers. It's just about learning how to manage that. So what I the some of the tools that I have acquired when I start overthinking is to number one, understand that it is time, like you say. A lot of the times we feel like we should be at another place where we are than where we are. And so we keep on thinking we should be at another place. Just breathe and say, I am where I'm supposed to be. So that is for me the first thing. And then the second thing is that taking action, no matter how small, it is it is literally just as small as what is the next thing I must do? Maybe it's just to update a bio. Maybe it's just to make a post. It's maybe just to go and sit for 10 minutes and write down some ideas. Just that quietness, that really helps a lot. I don't know what Loomer is trying to ask, Magrit. Because it's the second one, he's saying. Can you do a punch like boxing? <laughs> what if that is? Okay. Maybe you want you to knock me out. <laughs> okay, what other questions do you have? From Sunny Blowberg Strand. I'm a wedding planner. What would you suggest? Email marketing or a closed Facebook group on Facebook sharing advice, tips, tricks, and use paid ads to attract them. Okay, I can quickly answer this. So a, a closed group is always a good idea. However, before doing it, you have to know it's a lot of work. So I would not start there. A group is a lot of work. I would definitely start with a fantastic lead generation strategy and email marketing. But your lead generation should be something like um, a wedding planner for 12 months or something like that. Something you know people want. So when I did marketing for um, a wedding venue, um, we also ran lead ads to get the uh, to 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 actually talk to brides. But I think in your case, to start to create lots of educational content on social media, and definitely, um, are you planning to get married this year? You know, here's a nice guide, and then have an email automation on that. But also. Uh, let people get to know you. It is, it's so important. So if you can be the one that gives the tips and that, bride, you know, like people get to know you, it is quite, a, um, you only have clients one time. So you have to get new people in your system the whole time. What's very nice about paid ads is you can actually target people who's engaged. So you want to start uh, creating that relationship with them from when they are engaged and um, doing free lives like this is very, very good. If you can get people on like a private Zoom where you talk to them, what you need to know, what you need to know before choosing a photographer, what you need to know about the weddings, what is the best of weddings in your area. You know, there's so many things that you can attract people. And then just another tip, Pinterest is a very good platform, very, very, very good platform for weddings. So go and figure out how to put your post. So you put it on social media, but also on Pinterest so that you can get leads because brides go to Pinterest. So that would be my short advice. Awesome. Um, this one for you, Yandre. Guest house in a restaurant. Good. From Middleburg, Ethan Cape, please give advice for a guest house and restaurant. How to deal with other new restaurants that copies your recipes. So it's funny, like I, I actually created a reel yesterday about restaurants. And because I had a similar question of someone saying that they have 
experienced a decline in foot traffic, even though they have a really good reputation. And I thought about it for a second. And I think, you know what? People want to see three things from a restaurant on social media. They want to see your amazing dishes. So they want to literally see how amazing it is. So if you can hire a photographer that really knows what they're doing when it comes to the food space so that you can really put those delicious dishes in front of more people in a surrounding radius, like five kilometers or 10 kilometers. You know, it's very seldom that someone is going to drive further than 10 to 15 kilometers to go to a restaurant. So I'd say a five to 10 K radius is good enough on Facebook. And here's the thing. I would run reach ads. This is where I go against very a lot of the things. I always preach performance marketing. But if you're doing GEO fencing, then you basically just, uh, what is it? You, you uh, What is the word? I'm thinking of it in Afrikaans. You barking off. You bark, off barking. You basically just pick that spot, that radius. You secure that radius on, on your Facebook ads manager. And then I run reach ads at a high frequency. And I just show as many people as possible, the delicious food. And in parallel to that, what people pay a lot of attention to is reviews. So restaurant reviews are crucial for your business and your success. So what I would suggest is that you really spend time and effort on getting more reviews on Facebook, getting more reviews on Google. Even if you have to give people free desserts or if you have to give people coupons or whatever it is, free cocktails, but you want to encourage as many people as possible to review your restaurant, because I can tell you now, if you had a hundred more reviews than your competitor and they were at 4.3 stars and you were at 4.6, people are going to rather come to you. And that's just how it is because people pay attention to reviews. So you need to out review them <laughs> basically. So first of all, running strategic ads, showing your delicious dishes, then proving to people that those delicious that those dishes that look delicious are actually as amazing as you say they are and that's where the reviews come in because it then builds trust and credibility that it's actually true and then lastly i think it's structuring or creating some innovative offers so mm. i don't know what kind of restaurant you have but you know, kids is kids is a big thing. Like I know I've got two kids and we're always thinking, where can we take our kids? So, you know, can kids eat for free? Can you afford to do that based on your margins? Can kids maybe get a free milkshake? Um, is there something you can do with the kids, for example, number one? Number two, if it's not about the kids, is there a, a, maybe a, every Tuesday night, it's buy one cocktail, get one free. Um, or it is buy, buy a burger, get one free, or a pizza, buy a pizza and get one free, whatever it is. It's, can you structure certain deals throughout the week to bring those people in, um, to attract them to you? So this is where if your recipes, if someone is copying your recipes, then you have to outsmart them with your marketing strategy. So you either have to go and create other recipes, but then they might as well just copy those ones. There's no, there's no guarantee that they're not going to copy those recipes in the long term. So... It's understanding you have to outsmart them with with how you market the business. Um, obviously, still continue to improve your recipes as much as you can, but at the same time, realize that now it's about building brand, building awareness, building reputation. And if that is going to be better than your competitors, then people will most likely come to you. Um, touching on the last thing that I said about offers is people want value for money. And that's really what I'm meaning there from a restaurant point of view. They want to know that if they're going to be spending a thousand rand between three people or a thousand rand between two people, depending on the type of LSM your restaurant caters for. They want to know that they're getting the most value for money. So the number one, run those ads from a reach perspective to as many people as possible, as frequently as possible. Make sure you focus on your reviews and that you flaunt those reviews as often as you can on your social media pages and in your ads as well. And then three, um, start working on some offers potentially as well. And then lastly, maybe one last thing, and I think Makrit will agree with this, is just a restaurant should, your number one priority should be to build up a database of contact numbers and emails so that if you had to launch a burger night special, which you haven't had in the past, and you want to do the month of Feb, you've got a burger Fridays, you know, buy one, get one free burger. You want at least a sizable database to market to. So with the push of a button, 
you can send out a thousand, two thousand SMSs. With the push of a button, you can send five to ten, ten thousand emails if you had that database. So I suggest that as part of the marketing strategy that you build up a database of contact numbers and emails um, of people who want to hear from you and your innovative and creative offers as well and your latest dishes. So those are four tips that you can probably take with you. I hope it helps. Well, uh, brilliant. I love the reach ads, especially for local businesses. That is that is brilliant. That's Just how I, up, yeah. so reach, reach ads, high frequency. Just go. Because now it's now it's now you're playing the billboard game. So in this the nice thing is like you can play the billboard game a lot more strategically on Facebook than you can do anywhere else. So yeah. that's, that's and, and and you know what's the, the big gap? Because I think you say you're from the Eastern Eastern Cape. People um, in South Africa are not yet using ads as they should. So the the market, the, I mean, it is competitive, but it's not as saturated as the US or whatever. So the mm. ones that understand the ad games, they you know they they can use it. So definitely, um, I think that would be something that will help you a lot. I see our time has come to an end, and we've got some more questions. So um, Geraldine had a question. Man Cave is saying he wants to use your services. Man Cave. And okay, how do we prove that we are honest and trustworthy? Reviews, people normally buy from people they know, like, and trust. Reviews, 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 and organic posts on social media. Oh, there's so many things, but we don't have time for more. Um, we will continue next week. Shame. Thanks, guys. Much love and thank you for everything. Yeah. Thanks so much. I also have to go. I've got a Zoom meeting now where I teach Obviously. Facebook ads. So I have to jump on that. So thanks so much, Andre. It was lovely. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone who attended. And Bye. I hope we answered your questions. See you next week. Bye-bye.